Many people report that psychedelic experiences are some of the most profound moments of their lives. But is this just delusion? Can you discover truth on a psychedelic experience? Do these supposed insights gained while in an altered state of mind disappear once the drug wears off? Or can what you learn stick with you? These are the questions I'm trying to answer on the 54th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Hello, my friends and listeners. Welcome to the show. I'm coming to you today from Bangkok, Thailand. I just landed this morning, and the place I'm staying tonight doesn't have AC, and it hit 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so... If you hear some chirping in the background, that's because I've got the windows open trying to cool off. I've got another spectacular interview for you today. We're pushing the envelope and talking about a taboo subject, psychedelic drugs. Specifically, the experiences and supposed insights that are gained while on ayahuasca. If you don't know anything about psychedelic drugs, don't worry, this might pique your curiosity. But the drug ayahuasca is a psychedelic drink that's very popular in South America. I've got two guests on this week, both of whom are world travelers, personal friends, and they've both experienced the ayahuasca state of mind when they were traveling in Peru. So we met up while my wife and I were in Japan, sat down, and had an excellent conversation about their experience. I have yet to do any psychedelic drugs, I guess outside of marijuana, if that qualifies. I'm sure at some point I will partake, but I've been very hesitant. This some, I talk a little bit about this in the interview, but I've been very scared about heavy, mind-altering substances. Plus, as a philosopher, I've had lots of conversations with people who end up saying really remarkable things, and when you press them on it, they go, Whoa, well, Steve, you just got to take a psychedelic drug, take some magic mushrooms, and then you'll see what I mean. So like any other topic, I treat it with skepticism, but I think you'll find that this conversation doesn't get into the woo-woo, really. It meshes philosophy with experience, which I think turns into a beautiful mixture. My guests this week are Ryan Ferguson and Amanda Kingsmith. They are the hosts of the World Wanderers podcast, where they've been doing world travel for a couple of years now. They've been to more than 45 countries together, six continents. My wife and I met them in Atlanta about a year and a half ago, and we hit it off right away. Check out their website, theworldwanderers.com. You can also find them in iTunes. What you guys might find interesting about their show is it's not just, oh, hey, I went to this country, hey, I went to the city, look at these cool things we did, here's what I recommend. They try to incorporate their traveling experiences into their worldview. So it's a part philosophy podcast, and the ideas, many of them, come from their travels. So in addition to being world travelers and interested in philosophy, they are both advisors for the sponsor of the show, Praxis. If you guys don't know about Praxis, let me tell you about it. There's a movement underway right now of people who are starting to see through the shenanigans of academia. They're starting to see the outrageous price tag of getting a bachelor's degree is not justified. The value creation just isn't there anymore for the majority of people. And so they are awakening to the fact that you do not need a degree to have a successful career and a successful life. Praxis is at the center of this movement. They don't simply talk about ways to build a career without a degree. They are in the business of taking young, inspired, enthusiastic people and placing them at paid apprenticeships in the real world. So if that sounds like you, your curiosity has been piqued, head over to steve-patterson.com slash praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S. As I said, both of my guests this week are Praxis Advisors. So if you like their style and their intellectual honesty, that will give you a little taste of what you can expect as a Praxis participant. So I hope you guys enjoy my conversation about the ayahuasca experience with Ryan Ferguson and Amanda Kingsmith. 
from the World Wanderers podcast. So I have discovered that there's a lot of correlation between people's religious experiences and so-called psychedelic experiences. People take drugs and what they report the experiences they have, a lot of times it sounds like what religious people say they've had some experience. They were in a dream and an angel spoke to them and there's all this crazy stuff going on. And I think a lot of people dismiss religious or spiritual experiences out of hand, especially when there's drugs involved. They, if you take a drug, whatever is going on in your mind is just totally illusory. There's nothing you can learn from it. And end of story. And you're crazy if you try to learn something from a drug, drug experience. But I think that's a mistake. I think people report really positive effects from psychedelic drugs, and from religious experiences, even though these states are induced by uh, substances. There seems to be, some people say it's the most ex important experience of their life. I know some people like with LSD, they take an LSD and they go, oh man, this is like top five, you know, most important experiences I've ever had. So it seems like a really big error to me to just dismiss it all because that state was induced by some drug. You guys have done a lot of traveling and part of your traveling, you've also had this psychedelic experience. So I want to pick your brain about the nature of what that experience was like, what you learned from it, what you took from it, what your analysis is, maybe how people have reacted if you told them about this experience. So let's start with the, with the setting. Setting is how did you guys get, how, how did you guys decide that, oh, this is something I'm going to try? Where were you? How did you figure out like, oh, this is the person I'm going to do it with? Give, give some context for how that took place. So, uh, there's kind of a, a bit of a backstory. In 2013, we were both going through a bit of a rough time, and our lives both weren't extremely happy, and we had planned to quit our jobs and go traveling. And we eventually settled on South America, and during that time, I'd started to get into personal development. Um, and quite a few podcasts I had listened to at the time had had people on who had talked about... Um, the value of psychedelic drugs and specifically about ayahuasca experiences and so we had planned to go to south america and probably in that like three months before we left when we started to plan it out i was like okay this is something that i want to do hmm. um, and amanda wasn't i don't even know if we had talked about it at that time yeah it was interesting because my to-do list was things like Machu Picchu and Iguazu Falls and Patagonia and Buenos Aires. And Ryan's like, the one thing I know I want to do is ayahuasca. And I was like, I what? I've never even heard of this before. And I came from a background of my parents kind of just told me that drugs are bad, like mm -hmm. drugs equal bad. There's no scale of this. It's very black and white. Mm -hmm. If you do drugs, you're going to ruin your life. And so I never really questioned that. I never really ventured to learn more about that it's just something I had accepted up until that point and so when Ryan said I want to do this this psychedelic I was very like I don't do things like that I don't know about right. this and he said you know we're not going to be in Peru for a number of months so do your own research or something I'm going to do and make the decision for yourself hmm. yeah and for me it was just listening to people's stories about how how meaningful like like you said a lot of people were like this is one of the the most significant experiences of my life mm -hmm. and uh, I feel like I was really devoid of meaning at the time and was like this it just like seemed interesting to me mm -hmm. um and so I was like being just like the curiosity was pulling me like oh, I, I want to go do this and so we went to South America um in January of 2014 we traveled um, spent I think three months before we got to Peru Peru was our last stop, so like five months. Yeah, five months. So towards the end of our trip, we started doing more in-depth research about mm -hmm. where exactly can we do this. And it's kind of one of those things where if you start Googling, you get a mix of, well, actually a lot of horror stories. Mm -hmm. Like, you're probably going to die. You're <laughs> probably going to get stabbed in the jungle. Um, but we found a place that, that seemed really legitimate, uh, found a ceremony to go do, and it was just outside of Cusco. Cusco is the... Um, the hub people use when they're going to Machu Picchu, mm. and there's a place called the Sacred Valley, which is a kind of a, a lot of, kind of like a hippie destination. Mm. Um, and and ayahuasca is really known. Iquitos in Peru is kind of the most well-known spot for it, but there's other places in Peru because it's legal there. Uh, I think you can do it in Lima, 
near Cusco and then Sacred Valley as well. Hmm. Um, so we had just completed our trek of Machu Picchu. We piled into a van and took the van about 30 minutes out to this um, area called the Sacred Valley and went to a, a nighttime ceremony for ayahuasca. Um, and so the, the setting of that was the, the business that runs it has set up this kind of um, it's almost like a teepee like structure round circular tiered floor um, round a roof that extends really high up and then there's a hole in the top mm. um, which is kind of I think it's like the traditional I don't know like ceremonial hut thing uh, <laughs> if technical that's, that's the technical term that's what they tell tourists at least <laughs> yeah um, but so this one was like a nice version of that. They had flushing toilets. They had... It's a concrete building. Yeah, a concrete building. So it was enclosed. And then a big hole in the roof. And it was the full moon night we were there. So you could see the moon pass over oh. on the top. Um, so that's that's kind of the setting. Something that's really interesting about uh, the ayahuasca process, though, and something that kind of convinced me that, okay, this is an okay thing for me to do or it's oh. something that I want to try, is that it's, it's very much about the ceremony. Oh. And so when Ryan first mentioned it, I was like, I'm not going to eat some random Peruvian plant and have some like crazy exotic experience (laughs) where I go to Mars and maybe get lost in the Amazon and never return to Canada type thing. It's very much a sacred thing for, for the people there and Mm. um, something that they share with tourists. Now, if you want to do that, which is one of the things that I really like about it. So were both of you really hesitant because I, I my family I was also subjected to the same kind of drugs equals bad at this point I would call it propaganda but <clears throat> obviously there's lots of drugs that will screw you up but there is this spectrum of some drugs can can really help you out Were you guys I feel like in the the limited drug experiences I've had like I've smoked pot a, a few times and I deal with heavy anxiety in that state it's like oh no I'm in this state this is bad I've done something bad were you guys really anxious about starting? I was, for sure. Yeah, yeah, even I was. So our history with drugs, um, obviously we drank a, a reasonable amount, smoked pot a few times, but no experience with psychedelic drugs, um, no experience with kind of psychedelic experiences from even cannabis. So edibles is kind of mm. in that neighborhood. Um, nothing like that. So it was just like jumping in the deep end. Yeah. And... I had probably listened to, you know, 20 hours of people telling their stories about this thing. Because if you search on the podcast app for Ayahuasca, you can find quite a, quite a few um, episodes of people either going there and recording it or just recounting their experiences. Mm-hmm. And done, done a, a solid amount of research about people's experiences, um, some of the positive effects people have had. But also, just in going through and researching, you find these stories about like people getting murdered, um, women getting like sexually assaulted, because all the top, all the news stories about it are right. kind of these negative things. Right. And you you're going to the situation. Both of our perception of what a psychedelic drug was is really from like movies and TV mm-hmm. shows, and you've kind of counteracted that against stories, but you don't really know what it's going to be like. Right. You don't know if you're going to, um, you know try to jump off a building or like <laughs> run away into the forest or like right. completely, or go crazy. completely lose your ability to function. Yeah. 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 You, like you get all this propaganda. I remember um, in high school watching this video where I can't remember what drug it was. It was like something like mushrooms. And then um, the person like drills a hole into their head mm. in this video. Um, in a video? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if they actually that... show it. This is like grade 10. Oh. Like, Oh, check this out, kids. Is Whoa. that through the blue lens? Um, no, this was a different video. I think they yeah. don't show it, but it's like, this is implied what happened. I see, I see. Um, anyways. Yeah, so yeah, would... you're going in, you're like, even, so I had done a <laughs> no lot. No drills around. I, yeah, I had done a lot of research, but still felt quite nervous about it. And I think, Amanda, you were much more on the nervous side of the spectrum. Yeah, so the movie that I just asked you, if you were shown in school, um, uh, we were shown in school a movie called Through the Blue Lens, which is based in an area in Vancouver that's very heavily filled with people who are addicted to drugs. Mm. Essentially, their entire life revolves around getting their next hit. And it's really scary. Like, it's terrifying, especially when you're, you know, 15 years old and you're maybe at that age where your friends are starting to experiment with smoking pot and 
you've already been told that's bad, or at least for me, I've been told that was bad. And then I see this movie that completely is like, I don't want my life to turn into Uh that. Um, And obviously I still don't want my life to turn into that. And so, yeah, I remember even up until the point where we were loading into the van to drive to the concrete hut thing, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to do it. (laughs) So I've paid and it's not cheap. (laughs) I have gone, I've waited. I've been like debriefed. I've filed into a van and I'm still like, I don't know about this. And it wasn't until we actually got into the space that I kind of relaxed a little bit. Uh, The leader or the shaman, Diego, for the one that we did the first time was just very he kind of answered every question that was flowing through my head. Mm. I was like, are you in my mind? Because you have completely eased all of my concerns. Like I had seen, yeah, my idea of psychedelics was kind of like Euro trip where they drink like absinthe, absinthe and a little green, like mm. leprechaun fairy thing leads them on this adventure. Right. And I was like, what if a fairy comes and <laughs> takes me into the forest and I actually never return. Right. And then the next headline that pops up in the Calgary newspaper is like 25 year old female does ayahuasca and disappears in Peruvian forest right. never to be seen again. Right. Okay. So that's the worry. Totally legitimate. I'd be in the same boat. So the ceremony starts. Uh, what is the process of the actual ceremony, and when do you do the the first ingestion of the ayahuasca? So we did two ceremonies while we were in Peru. One was much more traditional, and one was, I think, I don't, I don't know what word to use it, like, I don't know. Maybe traditional with a hint of, like, easy newbies. Yeah, it was like, <laughs> clearly, yeah, one guy's like, we went into the jungle in Iquitos later, and they, that very much had the feel of, like, this is how we do this. Mm. And versus the other one, maybe, like, customer-centered mm-hmm. around people who hadn't done it before. Mm-hmm. Um, so the way the ceremony worked was everyone arrived at the, well, I'll just call it a temple, um, the shaman or the leader. Um, kind of just, and once everyone was settled, he kind of just sat everybody down and talked, talked us through the process which was really helpful to have someone who was able to do it in English because the second time we went, no English whatsoever. Mm. Um, and kind of talked us through what the experience, not what it was going to be like, but kind of some general principles about what to focus on. So you're supposed to sit there and they call it noble silence, just essentially meditate. Mm. Sit there, don't bother people, don't touch people, no matter what you feel like doing, just like stay in your space, um, stay silent. Uh, and then also just be really open to whatever comes. The metaphor they use, and I'm not sure how, if they would call it a metaphor, but is um, ayahuasca is going to show you things, and you just need to open, be open. Um, and mother ayahuasca. Yeah, and let it, let it come. Don't, don't try to block things off. Don't try to take this journey where you want to take it. Just be completely open to it, or else it's going to go, go bad. Yeah. Um, huh. And so... Talked us through maybe 30, 45 minutes about kind of the, some, some key things to focus on about how, you know, what happens if you get nauseous, how are you going to get to the washroom, um, you know, follow your handrail, like how there's people around to help you, how to respond to those people. And then in that one, it was a little bit larger. So they had organized it with all the new people around an outside tier and the middle tier people who had a bit more experience and in the very middle tier people who had the most experience. Mm-hmm. And so he called those people up to do the first um, drinking of the ayahuasca. How many people were doing this, by the way? There's probably like 50 to 60 in that first one. Wow. Okay, I was so going to say 40. Maybe 40. And there the was a, a lot of there. people the first time. Yeah, the second one there was only maybe like 10. Yeah, and so ayahuasca is a tea. Um, I think it's ayahuasca vine, and then they mix it with uh, a leaf of some sort. I could have got those mixed up. Two plants, to make a tea out of it. Uh, one has a lot of DMT in it. One... Um, kind of shuts down your body's inhibitors to DMT. Oh. And so you end up with this kind of like pinkish, sludgy, um, horrible tasting. It's really gross. Both of your faces Sludge. winced <laughs> when you're describing just, it. It's like absolutely disgusting. It's like if you took <laughs> socks that you'd worn straight for a week that were sweaty for like a whole football team and brewed them <laughs> in like a pot. like that's out there for... Just extremely bitter coffee. Maybe Uh, a little bit of vomit. (laughs) It really doesn't taste nice. And so the shaman and his helper were up at one end, and everyone kind of lined up on either side. Those were the people who were giving the drink, and they have these special little cups. And one of the first things that surprised me was how little they were actually giving to people. Um, They kind of, you go up, 
they size you up and then pour you a little glass, uh, kind of like bow their head to the glass, give it to you. You're supposed to do the same thing. You drink it. You kind of immediately stuck with like, oh, that's horrible. You kind of want to puke a little bit already. (laughs) And then you go back and sit down. And that's when you just start the noble silence meditating process. And so for us, because we were on the newbie tier, it was probably about 20-ish minutes before from the time the very first person drank to the time we drank, yeah. which was enough time for the nausea to kick in. That's about 20, 30 minutes um, is when the first round of nausea starts kicking in. So right as we were drinking, you could hear the people down in the bottom going like, <laughs> <laughs> starting to vomit. Um, and so just to set the setting a bit more, you're on a mat and everyone gets a little bucket to puke into because 98% of people are going to puke. They come around and clean out your bucket yeah. throughout the evening as well. And you'll have a little bit of water. Um, yeah, so you go up, <laughs> Yikes. go up, um, you know, check in, get your drink, go back, sit down. And then once everyone's drinking, um, the shaman, and then usually he'll have someone else there to help um, with, uh, they're called ikaros, which are like the, the traditional chants. And then the first one we went to, they were kind of playing more. Um, westernized versions of those so like the people in, in the middle had some people had guitars and drums and you kind of just lead you through these um, huh. the, these songs and if you google ayahuasca ikados on youtube you can listen to some of those huh. um, yeah and then you sit down and you know just just get going and so uh, one more setting thing this always happens at night um, so th- we got there around 10 p.m. The first time we drank was at 11 a.m., 11 p.m., and then there was two more times during the night when you had the chance to drink if you wanted to. So it went mm, through wow. the entire night. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay, so people probably don't pay to have a puking experience unless they have an <laughs> upset stomach. So you start with the puking, then then what happens? What is the, the At what point does thing, do things start happening in your mind? You go, okay, uh, now we've begun. So things happen right away. So you kind of meditate for about like 25, 30 minutes. And all of a sudden, like for me, I was just hit by this like tidal wave of emotion and nausea and sickness. And so it's it's not really like you just start puking the way you might imagine, mm-hmm. you know, the stomach flu comes on and all of a sudden you're throwing up. It's very much like you're, you kind of get washed over by the experience and you feel something. It's going to be different for every person. Um, for me, it was this realization that my physical body was really unhealthy. Mm. And then it's like the puking was kind of this cleansing. Mm. And so they said it in our, in our introduction and Diego, the shaman was like, anyone who has done this a lot knows what I'm talking about, but you'll start to crave the puking because it's like you process something and then you throw up and you're done with it, Mm. which is kind of this really interesting part of it. Did you have that experience? Did you feel like you were craving the puking? Yeah, but not until our, I wasn't really conscious of it until our second ceremony near the Mm. end where I was like, I just need to get this out. Mm. Like it's festering in my mind and it just needs to get out. But it's like, you can't force it out until you process it. Interesting. But even so, um, I think it's important. It seems like most, a lot of people have different experiences Mm -hmm. in terms of how this, like the rhythm of things goes. Um, But I imagine it being kind of like alcohol. So if you drink a lot of alcohol, for example, like if you've ever tried to take like four shots at once, um, you might get this like really strong wave of nausea immediately. And then if you don't puke, you're, you're good. Um, so it's kind of a similar thing. You take the drink and you're like, Oh God, I kind of just want to barf this up. Um, you sit down, you breathe. And then maybe like, you know, three, five minutes later, you're like, okay, cool. It's passed. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, Oh, okay. All those guys puked. But I, I just, I w- weathered this storm, <laughs> it's not going to happen. And so sitting there, not much is happening. Uh, I remember the first thing, I could I start to see like a bit of visual stuff, because you're just sitting there, it's dark, your eyes are closed. And then kind of a wave of euphoria. And then shortly after that, nausea just comes like, I don't know, like a truck and mm. smacks into you. And it's, so it seems like a lot of people kind of experience that, oh, sweet, I've made it. And then like have a bit of this like positive dump of um maybe brain chemicals or whatever and then the first round of nausea comes mm. on right after that okay so how long does the does that puking start and when does the when does the do you puke throughout the whole thing or is it like a puking beginning and then you have all the, the mental stuff and then and then what happens 
it seems to come in waves yeah huh? yeah it's kind of like throughout the whole time they're there yeah i could like when i think about to my personal experiences it was like something negative riding this like wave of whatever emotion if it was anger or sadness or um, like envy or you know whatever i was feeling that i was processing throwing up and then having this like euphoric i'm dancing in a field and i'm like this gypsy woman in my mind <laughs> followed by oh god i'm crying and you know everything hurts my whole body and then it's like throwing up or um, lots of people get diarrhea as well so there's lots of people kind of going to and from the bathroom so when you say you're a gypsy woman dancing in a field is that was that a visual that you had did you or was it just like it was kind of like a metaphorical way you interpret how that felt or? no that was a personal visual <laughs> right <on. laughs> that was a good one um but if, so it is at least for me the the idea of psychedelics i had going in was kind of like almost as like that 70s show version where it's like it's going to be like this heavy visual like oh steve turned into a cat and now he's got his head he's yeah something like that and it was um much less visual like than that i felt like i could close my eyes and then if you're like closing your eyes and kind of open to to just like even though it's darkness just like looking into that it's like start stuff will start to come off hmm. but then you can open your eyes and you're back in the room really um and it's not like you've you've you're stuck you know watching this television screen oh, you can okay. kind of turn it off um that's what i thought it was too it gets there at like certain points mm. when it's really strong but then there's much more feeling than i would imagine so that was kind of what was surprising to me i was like oh this visual isn't as compelling as i thought it was going to be um, but the feelings are just really intense and really strong. Okay, so let's talk about the visuals. So, first of all, like, can you give me some examples of the visuals that you saw? And then the interpretation of the visuals. Why, when you were a, a gypsy in a field, was that something, like, that's correlated with a particular feeling of happiness or, or being free or something like that? So, what were the, what are some of the things that you saw? Yeah, so that one before I was the gypsy woman, I um, it was a, a happiness that had come out of a sadness. So the sadness was that I was on my side. So my entire thing, I was really tired. And so mm. they, they recommend not lying down because if you kind of like lose control and you throw up, then you can choke. Mm. Um, and I was very aware of that, but I needed to lie down because I was very, very tired. Mm. I couldn't stop yawning. There were like these big, massive yawns and I could not stop them. Mm. And so I think Ryan was really aware of me at that point um, because I was lying on the ground. But at one point I was on my side and I was I was crying and I was shaking and I was in this cobblestone street, like as if it was 1800s in England or something. It was pouring rain and I was mm. homeless and it was very cold. Mm. So I was physically not cold in the room because it's very temperate and I was wearing like a sweater and pants. But I was really, really cold in my vision. And then that kind of passed and I rolled over on my back and all of a sudden the earth and all these kind of insects were climbing over me. Oof. And I had heard about, you know, people have these really terrifying insect visuals mm. that are like, you know, they're absolutely awful. And this was this really beautiful thing. Like mother earth was kind of taking me in and hugging mm. me with her soil and the bugs were crawling on me, but it was like, I knew I was safe. And mm. then there was a zebra and the zebra all of a sudden <laughs> burst open, the rib cage burst open, and all these butterflies came out. And I came out with that. And wow. then I was dancing in this beautiful field. And I was like, wow. kind of like Esmeralda from uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Okay. I think okay. I had like a tambourine. <laughs> was it kind of like a movie that was playing this? Yeah. For you? yeah. Was it, was it, were you viewing yourself from your first person, or was this the third person you were seeing yourself, like you're seeing your, your body? So from your body. when I was in the street and I was like, I, I was like in my body, like I was actually rolled over. Mm. And when I opened my eyes, I knew I was in this room, but it was really hard to open my eyes because it's like I had to feel this overpowering, like coldness and sadness and suffering. And then it was kind of more third person. Mm. So when I rolled on my back, the bugs, it felt like it was actually happening to me. Mm. Like if I opened my eyes, I knew it wasn't. But whenever I closed my eyes and I kept my eyes closed because it was really pleasant, mm. this was happening. And then the gypsy part was more like I was watching it. Now, was there a was there a kind of something in the back of your mind? Where you, did you still have access to like this this reality where you could say, OK, I know this is not happening. Like you said, you could open your eyes and your back or are you just totally enamored by what's happening? Does it feel really really real 
it's kind of it's kind of a blend so I think that you always know like I always knew that I was in the room and that I was who I was and that that was my reality but then there was points where it's so overpowering that it's you know your eyes are closed and you keep your eyes closed to have this experience hmm. I don't know if that answers so it's question. kind of a voluntary choice to get to experience it and you didn't feel like you were there and you were just stuck and reality had changed underneath you no, but at the same time, I think that there were points where it would have been hard for me to open my eyes and get up and move. Like, I don't, I don't think it's the type of thing you can just, like, mm. shake your head and be, be out of it. Yeah, you feel pretty compelled to kind of be with your, like, eyes closed in this experience. But you, I, I kind of get the feeling that, like, you know, if, if all of a sudden, oh, there's a fire in the corner... Um, it never felt like we wouldn't just be able to, like, mm. get out of the building... Mm. Um, you could feel like you can, I guess if you were like carrying a weight, it was like you had to like pick up this like 40 pound bag to be kind of stuck in, in the experience of just like sitting in a temple. Mm -hmm. And then it was like less weight to just mm. be lost in the, the vision. Was there any, so when I think about like the stereotypical, oh, somebody does these psychedelics and then they go crazy. It's that they get stuck in that, in that other state and then they, they can't get out of it so you guys didn't feel like that was part of it and do you think that that's just how much you took do you think if you took a bunch more you really would be kind of thrown there for a while so the experience i had was the first few times um, i think the best way to think of it is like you have these waves um so you kind of go as like the experience gets more intense and there's like really intense pain and nausea and emotional pain and, and visions that all kind of come together. And then you kind of like break out from that and it gets a bit more um, pleasant and easier to, to be back in like reality. Hmm. Um, I had points where it got so intense that I, I don't know if I could have, uh, you know, interacted with, reality in, in a normal way mm -hmm. like it was like it felt like i was completely going mad things were spinning mm -hmm. it was kind of just like intense physical pain um and completely lose touch with the fact that this isn't just um a, you know a vision that's happening mm -hmm. so can you talk about some of the visuals that you had yeah so so that one that i was referring to is is was an experience of um i i can't remember the exact timeline of it, if it was, had this really intense physical pain and then slipped into that, or it was kind of like mix mash between the two. Mm -hmm. But I'd gone through this, the, the most intense purging of the process. This was probably like an hour or 20, an hour and a half into it, where I puked and puked and puked and then it started dry heaving. Mm -hmm. And I had to move from seated to like being on my hands and knees. And it was um, just experiencing extreme emotional pain as well. Like mm -hmm. it was crying and I remember thinking like I've got like nothing left um, mm. like as if I was like saying this to whatever was making this happen like mm. I've got nothing left I can't do this anymore mm. um, and, and during that same period of time I was having these uh, I kind of like slipped into this kind of like madness state almost where it's, it's hard to put into words but it was like things were you know rapidly spinning and I was getting these visions of this like shriveled up dying thing uh, um, and I kind of like connected immediately with like this is part of me this is like the negative parts of me this is um, the negative parts of me dying mm. um, but yeah so it's like things were like spinning I was like this vision was flashing back to me and mm. I was kind of just stuck in it mm. um, and, and at that point in time I was like I just want this to end I just want to be um, you know done with this mm -hmm. and it was kind of like I mentioned before where they tell you you really got to be open to this experience mm -hmm. and when you're fighting the experience that's when things progressively get worse and mm -hmm. worse and worse mm -hmm. so the metaphor they use is kind of like this mother ayahuasca wants to show you something and if you're going to avert your eyes from it it's just going to get progressively stronger and stronger and stronger um, and so that's kind of what the experience mm -hmm. felt like I was having um, where this vision of this dying baby and things were spinning and I remember thinking and like this is what like madness is like mm. this is what it feels like and is it because you couldn't put together a thought process or is it because your like your sensory input was just totally chaotic you couldn't make sense of it yeah it was totally it was 
well, not totally chaotic because I could with the baby I had yeah. that. I, mm-hmm. That was very firmly there, but that was like the only thing, and it wasn't consistent. It was like, oh, now it's back, now it's gone. Mm-hmm. Um, what was it in between? Was it just? It just felt like just a blur, spinning madness, like sensory data that I couldn't I see. deal with I see. at all. Was there still? Could you still think? Were you still kind of aware? Were you thinking like, oh, this is madness? Like, was that thought? Yeah. So that that was a thought that occurred to hmm. me at the time, and also. A lot of it was just like, I just want this to end, mm. like, kind of make this stop. So it's kind of like you, you still had some mental um, capacity. It was just the sensory data that you were getting to try to analyze was just purely chaotic or almost purely chaotic. Yeah, yeah. And then um, mm. the, it's, it's hard to, to kind of know with the timeline of these realizations, but the way looking back at it afterwards, how it occurred to me was, um, I had always separated, I had, you know, an experience leading up to this where I had had some issues with alcohol and, um, done some things while drinking that I really wasn't proud of. Um, and just generally like I didn't really look in the mirror at myself and feel good about the person that I was. Um, and I'd have these moments of like real disconnect with like, I can't be that person. So this is prior prior to ayahuasca. Mm. Um, Like, how can I be a good person and do these things? Mm. Um, And so in that moment of like, it was like the second I saw that dying baby, I knew that this was the negative parts of myself. Mm. Um, In in some way, there was not like, there wasn't any time between me seeing this, like, hmm, what could this mean? Like, maybe this is a good theory. It was just kind of like, boom, instant. Mm. That's Mm. what I'm thinking about. Mm. And then as this madness, spinny thing, kept happening as I eventually uh, the thought popped in my mind like you can't separate the negative parts of yourself uh, from yourself like th- this part of you that's dying is you huh. um, and like it's like you dying like who you are is the person who's done these things huh. um, and then it was kind of this moment of like okay I just need to be like okay with myself dying um and then it was kind of in that moment when things kind of like cleared up wow and then i went kind of so this was kind of the peak of the experience and then had this really long smooth euphoric um experience where i felt like i dealt with much lower level concerns like um we can talk about this later but a lot of like physical things about my body Mm -hmm. um, and kind of like connected to the group and was listening to music and just had an experience of joy that I'd like never really had before but that was all kind of this like moment of having this kind of connection and then everything cleared up and I was like back in this kind of state where I could interact with the room and kind of interact with the visuals that were happening. Okay so I'm going to try to rephrase that and if, if this is a correct summarization or like a, one interpretation of it, or if this is incorrect, then, then please correct me. It is as if there was, it is as if there's two minds at play here. Let's just, for the metaphysical sake, let's just say it's two minds, but it's still within your mind, really. You have the regular um, Ryan mind who was experiencing all this chaos. It was like, uh, this must be what madness is like. And then you have this other mind that's saying, okay, there's a big problem in your life. And that's you have done these things that you feel really bad about. And you feel so bad about them that you said, that's not me. It can't be me. And that is causing other trouble in your life. And the way that you're going to overcome that is by realizing that those things aren't separate from you. The truth is they really are you, but that part of you can die. Like you can, you can accept it and you can move past it because that part of you can die as this really like profound psychological healing trick almost, or like technique. So it is, and when you realize that or when you accepted it, then you, there was a kind of healing. In a, in a psychological sense. Is that a fair way to rephrase it? It is as if that kind of teaching with the two minds is a correct way to think about it? Yeah. That's remarkable. 
And before I want to, I want to dive into your experiences, but before we, I really want to revisit that because this seems like a very common theme in the way that people talk about psychedelic experiences. You can see it's not a stretch of the imagination to say, oh, well, that other mind that's doing that, well, that's God. You know, and God loves you, and so he's showing you the truth, which is how you become a better person. Like, you can see how that is a powerful, powerful narrative. Try to, try to put it in a, meta, in a yeah. sound metaphysical context is difficult, but there's obviously something very profound going on. Yeah, I feel like if I had a religious background growing up, that's, that's the way I would have to interpret that. Right. Um, yeah. But since I didn't, I, I interpreted it in a different way. Right. So we'll, we'll dive into the metaphysics. Yeah, I was just going to say it's really interesting because, like Ryan kind of touched on this, it's it's like everything that comes up, you kind of have this, you get the sense for what it's about. Mm-hmm. Like, for me, my first wave, my vision was of a dying fetus. Hmm. So and you both had that. It's kind of dying baby fetus. So mine was like external and older. Yeah, and mine was like mm. a baby. So at first I was kind of confused because... I was clutching my bucket. I was crying a lot. I felt deeply, deeply sad. Like I had lost something. And I was like, this is really strange. Like if I had had a stillbirth or lost a baby at some point, that would have made very clear sense to me. But Mm. I've never had those experiences in my life. And all of a sudden I got this sense like, oh, you're really unhealthy. Your physical body is unhealthy. You need to take care of yourself. And then I got crazy tired. And if you just looked at if Mm. somebody was watching that as a movie... They would be like, how did you get that? But I just got this sense. It was just this feeling. It's like something told me Mm. that that's what it was, Mm. which is kind of strange. Yeah, it's almost like you know what these things mean, Um, like just intuition kind of. Yeah, and when the bugs were crawling on me, I was like, I know I'm safe. I, I never for a second was like, like I was like, oh, I've heard of these situations being really bad in psychedelics and mm-hmm. people get really scared. But for me, this is really great. Like, I love this. The earth is kind of like eating me and rebirthing <laughs> me. And I was like, oh, wow, I need to spend more time in nature. Like, I forgot how much I love being outside and I should hike more and do all these things. Mm. Um, but if you were just watching that, you'd be like, oh, this is kind of crazy. Now, did you feel the same way that it was, it was, it was as if somebody was, like you said, telling you that, that oh you need to spend more time in nature or was it like you got this realization and you, you felt safe and then you realized internally like oh I should spend more time in nature or oh, I should I should do these other things that will help my body yeah that's a good question and I'm not sure if I entirely know the answer to that it, it feels like somebody else is telling you mm-hmm. but I think that it's probably this idea of you know we have things in our subconscious and in our mind that are deeply deeply hidden Mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that ayahuasca has been said to do is help people to find out what they really want to do with their life Mm. so it's you know a friend of ours that we interviewed on our podcast connected to his love of art and now he's pursuing a a career in art and it's something that he loved as a child and it kind of got lost through years of schooling and business school and all these things and his ayahuasca experience was like you love art and I don't know if you could say that that's like God or Mother Ayahuasca saying that. Some people might, but I think that you could just say that it's something that's deeply buried within your mind, Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it comes up again. The most important part you might say is that it's true. Mm -hmm. It seems like these these people people connect with these experiences are like, I've I've spoken very favorably of an experience I had when I fell in love, realized I was in love with my wife, Julia, that I had this, um, it was as if somebody was speaking to me, and it was... Uh, as much as you love Julia, that's how much I love you. And it very much felt like it was a separate, like it was God, really felt mm-hmm. like that. Now, it could be maybe my mind was accepting myself and there was, a, there was some self-love there and, and all of that. But it was this, it, it has the overwhelming feeling like it is some other greater, much greater mind teaching you some truth about yourself or about the world or whatever, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, definitely. Especially when it comes to things like, like we both had things around our physical health. It seems like, you know, we are ourselves. We live in our bodies every day. Why are we not connected to this, to this thing that Mm. we now know to be true? Like I, I came out of it being sort of thinking to myself, why have I not connected with the fact that I'm not entirely physically healthy? Mm -hmm. Why have I not felt this before? Mm -hmm. You know, it must be somebody else who's told me because I haven't been aware of it. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, when I think about it, I think that it was always there and I was just not tuning into it. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's a lot of moments of clarity that come up, um, like through my experience, even just like these small details of like, oh, that makes sense to me now. Oh, that makes sense like to me Like past now. experiences you had had that, yeah, that so you didn't understand? Yeah, so just like understand. kind of like integrating these things that you've like learned on one level, but you mm. haven't like really like completely grokked. Mm. Um, yeah, I had one, like, I kind of, like, gotten into yoga a little bit before, and mm-hmm. I was, like, just thinking, I was, like, oh, okay, this is what we're trying to aim at with that, physically. Um, and then I'd been reading Ayn Rand not too long before, and, like, a couple things from that book were just, like, oh, I get that now. Like, yeah. this makes total sense to me. Yeah. Um, and I remember af- after that experience, so this was probably, like, 6 a.m., the morning, we hopped in the car to get back down to the valley, and I pulled out my iPhone to just write some notes and I was like okay I'll write more about this later but I'm just going to write like you know top five things I've kind of learned and realized and just wrote for ages I probably really? wrote like 30 <laughs> bullet points about kind some some related stuff but just like all sorts of different stuff and this was about mainly yourself and your own your history and, or was it about was it about the world did you learn just, something yeah so a lot of um, I would say like psychological stuff physical stuff because I'd been going through a back injury Mm. and a lot of my experience was kind of around um, understanding some things about about that and um, just my body Uh, yeah other things some some goal related stuff about just like I don't know I'm pursuing this track of life that I don't enjoy like I should just do the things I want to do there's no there's no risk involved Mm. Um, big picture risk yeah just all sorts of stuff now I've heard, I, don't, I have no idea if this is true, but I've heard that, um, I think it was Francis Crick who discovered the double helix structure of DNA, um, supposedly had this insight while on LSD. So now that would be an insight, if correct, about the external world, not just the profound truths that they learn about themselves and their psychology and their history and, and all of that, but something about physics or yeah. like that did you guys have any of that was there did you understand at least other people better maybe if not yeah. the, the structure of the molecules or something? Yeah, other people for sure and something that's interesting to that that maybe you can put in the show notes is um, i was listening to an interview a little while ago i can't remember the name of the researcher but they were doing research on microdosing oh. um so oh. pulling in scientists microdosing on lsd i don't even know if they were microdosing or taking more serious doses and then um, these pe- trying to select people who were working on problems using LSD and then seeing if they had mm. um, breakthroughs. And many of those people had breakthroughs. I don't really? remember the name of it off the top of my head. Accurate right. breakthroughs that like confirmed, or was it like hallucination? Yeah, they were able to like solve a lot of the problems they mm. had been stuck on. Um, mm. These were like mostly scientists, I believe. Um, but I can find you that link. Yeah, that'd be great. One of the things that I worry about. <clears throat> I've listened to some of the lectures by um, a guy's name, uh, Alan Watt, and he talks about, or Alan Watts, whatever his name is, the kind of Eastern, um, or he's a, a, a British guy who had a, like a bunch of training in, I think, Buddhism and stuff like that. He speaks yeah. very highly of psychedelic drugs. And he talks about another type of epiphany or revelation or solving of problems that people have in these states and it's something I worry about because I don't like this idea very much where he says you know people will have these epiphanies in the moment and then they'll realize after the fact like oh that was a stupid idea one of them this is a a, trying to um, remember it correctly it's not exactly correct he said he was speaking to a lady who had one of these experiences and discovered that you know all of, of life is essentially reducible to the smell of burnt almonds. <laughs> <laughs> and then she thought that was like, she held on to that. I was like, ah, oh, this is it. So she wrote it down yeah. so she wouldn't forget. And then she looks back and I was like, that doesn't make any sense. This is kind of silly. <laughs> but he said, no, actually, I, th- I like that. There's truth to that. And then he kind of took that idea and tried to build on it. That is what somebody who, with a very rational disposition looks at and says, whoa, 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 whoa. Scientists are having insights about the world, but they're making crap up that they think is profound, or they have insights into themselves, but they're making all this crap up. Yeah. So, do you guys feel like the insights that you had were that kind of absurdist that you look back and are like, "That's that doesn't make sense 
but it did at the time? Or is it like, no, what you discovered you feel like really was true? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think that the personal experiences were all true for me. Hmm. Uh, I think that most of my first experience was like cleansing my psyche. I think it was like, you know, they've described ayahuasca as if, if personal development or going to therapy was peeling the layers of an onion, ayahuasca shatters your onion to a million different pieces mm. and you, you don't do it layer by layer. It kind of just forces you to deal with everything all at once, mm. which I found to be very true for myself. My second experience and near the end, I kind of dove a little bit deeper and I ended up taking this sort of strange bus thing that was spinning with other people, which if you look into ayahuasca stories, they'll say, if you end up on a transportation mode with other people, sometimes you're actually traveling with these other people's minds, huh. which is completely obscure and hard to <laughs> like tangibly understand. And then I got transported to this location that was this tree with sort of a fuzzy fairy thing that was black and super beautiful. And she was telling me that the universe was located within a tree. And I came out of that being like, wow, that's a little bit strange. Did you think it was true at the time? Or were you, when, when the fairy said that, were you like, yeah, you're full of shit? No, I was like, wow, this is so amazing. Like, I know, <laughs> like, I know the keys to life. Like, I have the answers now. I understand the universe and how it was made and where we all are. And then I came out of that and was like, what on earth was that? Now, was the... Was the degree of belief similar when you realized you know you you had those these internal insights about your mind and you thought wow this is true was it the same degree of belief that you had when you realized oh the universe came out of a tree no no it wasn't there was so, things that were very certain to me like your physical body is unhealthy or you know you're being rebirthed into nature like mm. go go be outside versus this concept that I was kind of like, wow, this is so interesting. Like it was almost like childlike wonder mm. as if you were in, like as if somebody had taken me to Disney World and was like, look at this magic castle and I look see. at, look at Mickey Mouse. Like Mickey Mouse is so cool. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that if you were to have like analyzed that, like if in the midst of this amazing experience, you were to have this little edge of skepticism about the fairy, do you think that you would have believed, still been like, wow, well, the fairy said it, so it's got to be true? Or do you think like, well, maybe this isn't, maybe this isn't the case? Or is it just totally overwhelming that like everything that comes out of this fairy's mouth is, <laughs> is, is, is <laughs> yeah, a true so, claim? So part of it was that the experience was very colorful. So everything was like the most beautiful sunset you've ever seen with hmm. hues of purple and pink and orange and yellow. And this tree was very dark and this fairy was very beautiful. Like she was almost like a mouse like thing with this black velvety face. And I kept wanting to like, you know, touch the velvet, <laughs> <laughs> which is very strange. And so I think I was very overwhelmed by that experience. Hmm. Um, I came out of that though being like I think that I could I mean I could choose to go around and tell everyone that I had this ayahuasca experience where a fairy took me to a tree and was like <laughs> the universe is in a tree but <laughs> people yeah. might think yeah. I'm a little bit wacky yeah, I do think you, you like it gets really strong and then it fades out and then you have this process of kind of integrating mm. what happened and I think you see clearly some of these things that were like oh that's actually just down <laughs> uh, we had an experience of not an ayahuasca experience but um, a psilocybin experience just ourselves um, out of context I remember I grabbed a guitar at the time and I was like I don't know why that we play these things this way maybe we should play them this way <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like trying to do it, you know, and like just messing around with it. So for people it, that can't can't see what Ryan just did, he just turned the guitar upside down. It's so like the butt of the was guitar like is... hugging it and just like pulling on the strings. <laughs> um, and at the moment, it's like, oh, this is interesting because I feel like I feel like a lot of the we don't like question a lot of the rules mm. normally, mm -hmm. and then. Um, when you're doing it, it kind of like a, a lot of the rules like don't make sense. You're like, I've never really questioned why we play the guitar this way. Right. And in that moment, I'm like, oh, I haven't questioned. I don't know why we play the guitar. I'm going to want to play it this way. This feels better. Um, <laughs> but then afterwards, you're like, okay, I understand why we play the guitar that way. <laughs> because well, so you can't do it the other way. <laughs> while you're in that, though, 
So I love the idea. In fact, that makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense. That when your mind is kind of thrown into this alternative way of viewing things, you start to realize just how arbitrary a lot of the rules are. Like how the the procedures we follow in everyday life aren't thought about. They're just we just act them out kind of uncritically. So I think there's a lot of merit to that, especially if you're trying to think about a theory and you're stuck, in, you're, you know, you're hitting a wall and then like, oh, maybe the way I metaphorically get around this problem is by holding the guitar this way. Like, I think that's, that's really cool. But at that moment, did you think like, wow, this is, this is right. This is, this is the case. Or was it like, this is something I'm going to explore. Hmm. Like, let's, you know, let's see how far I can go with yeah, this. Yeah. It was kind of like I had this feeling um, so something that happens in, in this experience is you kind of get into like a, f a flow state. Mm. Sometimes you can like start to, especially physically for me, like do things that I d didn't think were possible, um, especially around flexibility. Um, but also around the first time we had this experience with like rhythm, people were like playing the drums and I'm not a musical person at all. And just kind of like instinctually felt this like rhythm of the room, which is a really bizarre experience for me because I have no musical background yeah. and I always consider myself um, not really capable of like holding a rhythm. But yeah, I could yeah. just like just instinctually do it. Um, so you kind of get these feelings of like, oh, I feel like this is going to work. Hmm. And then... Uh, that particular experience I started, I was like, no, this, is, <laughs> this does not work. I tried it for a while. <laughs> I remember I was, I did pot once or however you smoked pot. <laughs> I used the wrong verb when I write. Um, I sm smoked the marijuana and <laughs> I was like, okay, so I know a lot of people have spoken highly about um, playing music and uh, like the musical experience and I know one of the most tactile things I guess not really tactile but the most uh, sensory uh, changes that I get while in that state of mind is when I'm listening to music like I li like listening to music and I do consider myself musical but you can hear things in music that you otherwise couldn't it's like what I could do in that state of mind is almost separate tr the track so I could hear the I could hear the drums and I could hear the guitar kind of doing separate things and yet I could also hear them together. So it's like I, it was like I was of two minds there, not, yeah. not a logical contradiction, but it was this really amazing experience because then and then you could see that you could the harmonies were much more powerful. It's like, wow, this is just so beautiful. You could almost kind of see it. It was yeah. a very powerful experience. So I thought, okay, well, well why don't I try to play the piano because people play piano while they're, while they're high. And I was like, what I noticed, which was really interesting, is when I was sitting at the piano, I have some measure of musical theory that, that I understand, like in scales, all the different scales. And I could see a lot more opportunity for how to put the notes together. It was like, oh, I, it's really easy to fall into like ruts when, you're, when you know how to play a musical instrument and these are the scales, these are the notes you play. But I saw there was a whole realm of possibility that I, w I, w I hadn't seen. I was like, oh, this is great. But it was my trying to execute playing that I was totally incompetent. Like I was trying, mm. it was hard for me to keep the rhythm. I was like almost too much in my head and be like, oh, I could do this, I could do this. Yeah. But it was hard for me to, to execute. So somebody from the outside would have seen me like, brr, brr, you know, like it was <laughs> terrible. But from the inside, I was like, no, I'm trying to communicate this, this thing that I know I, is there. I just can't quite yeah. get it out. Did afterwards, were you able to, to like have any... Uh, kind of breakthroughs musically? Well, I wasn't, if I were spending a lot of time with music, I would have, because I look back on what it was, and I remember it was like, there was, I think it was some, there was some funky note in the blues scale that I was like, oh, yeah, I, don't, I don't play this note enough. Like, this, you can actually integrate it. So it was, it was a correct insight. Yeah. I just couldn't, I couldn't make it work. Yeah, um, that's really interesting. Yeah. Something that's interesting related to music, um, and you were kind of talking about how you could see the music, um, and not to get like scattershot just like shooting off these experiences yeah. but i think people find it interesting mm -hmm. is um so during the ayahuasca experience there is this traditional chanting or the music playing and that's really connected to the the puking that's going on in the room in a really weird way you can mm. like the music feels heavy and like you can feel it so it kind of like they'll play these uplifting songs and you'll feel this like oh amazing sense of joy and then the music stops and it's like the room gets this like pain sinks over you and gets heavy um uh, people start puking more when the music stops 
and then crying also as well. crying really? and then there's a certain song especially the second time we did it with it was just this uh, indigenous woman um with a fern type thing going this like chick, 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 uh, and kind of these like evil sounding things mm. but she could do like lighter end stuff but then she'd go dark and you would just hear everyone start puking um really yeah, yeah. and you could like yeah it was weird it felt like you were kind of the instrument that was being played hmm. in a way um <laughs> with the, the sound of the puke <laughs> yeah <that> like what <laughs> it didn't, obviously puking doesn't sound good although it can be it you kind of have these light-hearted moments that happen uh, during the second one there was a woman who was puking like no one i've ever heard puking before yeah. and then everyone was just a, a number of people were just laughing hysterically and then she yeah. started laughing because yeah. she was like <laughs> like a dinosaur um yeah you thought that was hilarious you were laughing yeah, I just, like, so couldn't, hard couldn't stop laughing but yeah you can like you can feel mm. the emotion that's being communicated mm. in the music interesting in this really um really real way that you can't don't seem to feel it like maybe if you you know it's late at night you're like looking out at the stars and you're playing some music mm. um out of your car or something like that it's like that type of feeling but just cranked cranked way up mm. yeah it seems like the waves that you experience as the person in the ceremony is almost coming from the music that's being played and i don't know there might be some intentionality behind that maybe to draw people you know in and out of these experiences mm -hmm. But definitely, it's like the whole room would be sort of like light, and it's like as if everyone was dancing. And it's not, it's not like absolute. Like there's still oh. some people who seem to be having a good time when it gets really dark, mm. and there's still some people who seem to be having a bad time when it gets really light. Right. The girl beside me in our first experience lied on her side and cried the entire time. Mm. I don't think I've. And obviously, I mean, I was having my own experience. I wasn't just paying attention to her, but there were some points where my experience is really light and pleasant and happy and I, I felt like my feelings going out to her mm. um, because she seemed to be in so much pain. Now Vitigo when you were describing your experience you said you were in a bus with other people that and that one of the things you read is that it's as if you are kind of having the same mental you're like in the same mental zone as these other people. Did you talk to those people? Did they also report the same experiences? So I don't know who any of those people are. Like mm. I didn't know anyone. Uh, and coming out of it, I wasn't like, oh, you were on my bus last night. Oh, okay, so it wasn't. There was nobody you recognized from that. Yeah, yeah, no, there wasn't. There's is it seven degrees or seven stages that they say? Um, yeah. So there's uh, some people who have theories about how there's kind of stages of ayahuasca, um, and. Oh, it seems like a, a lot of people have things that kind of correlate to these experiences. Like, uh, you know, at a certain stage, you kind of feel like you dissolve and like disappear as a person. Hmm. Um, and a certain stage, it's like a common way to go between them is like some sort of like mythical animal takes you in some sort of vehicle and then you have your experience shifts to a different experience. Um, and that's one of the things we actually read I hadn't read that at all, and then we read it afterwards, and we were talking, and we were like, oh, weird, This is the thing you're talking about is exactly the thing that happened to this person. Oh, yeah. Um, huh. yeah, there's a website that talks about it that's really good. You should find that website for yeah. the show notes. Um, it's it's not something that, like, I don't, I don't believe, like, fully in it. I think that it is kind of interesting to think about, you know, other people having these experiences, and then you know, people coming together and being like, oh, wow, I was transported on the same, like, spinning bus thing mm. that is kind of like a ride that you'd see in an amusement park, but it was definitely a bus in here. Like, oh, weird, you had that too? Mm. Uh, it's just interesting to think about how people can have sort of similar experiences, yeah. but they're still fully different. And the second time we did it, it was a small room. I think there was 10 of us, 12 maybe. Um, and one of the women was epileptic, so she didn't actually drink ayahuasca she was just there and um we had to leave really quickly the next day but I, I was really curious about what her experience was like but unfortunately we didn't have the chance to talk to her mm. um because you just have this like you know everyone in the room is having such strong experiences and everyone drinks ayahuasca including the shaman including the helpers um and they just seem to be able to you know they've done it so much they just function fine but i would have love to find out what 
mm. what her experience of this room was like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to know what the shaman's experience would be like um, guiding people through that. <clears throat> so you mentioned one of these um, levels or layers was a disillusion of the ego. This is also something or disillusion of the self. This is it comes up in religious texts all the time. Did either of you have that experience? Yeah. So the the second ceremony we went to um, was actually it was actually shorter. So the first one was all night, and they offered three times. I drank twice. Amanda drank three times. Yeah. And it kind of goes on like this. It seems around like, you know, an hour and a half kind of peaks and then fades, but it's different for different people. Mm. Um, so the second time we went, I just drank one time and had this like blast off into outer space type experience. Um, but yeah, at one point you just, I was lying there and ju I just answer your question. I'll just kind of relate my experience. Um, and could f feel this, like my eyes were closed and it kind of, you could kind of see like the stars kind of like there were in some sort of space is like the closest thing to what it looked like and this like thicker black stuff kind of like coming towards me mm. and um the so if you if you ever stop and close your eyes and just kind of meditate on what the end of your body feels like like what does the tip of my finger feel like what does my hands feel like it's mm. kind of just this buzzing it's hard to tell like what exactly mm. where do you end and where did the space begin um that got more and more pronounced and i kind of felt like this feeling of like my body was just kind of like dissolving um mm. and then <clears throat> kind of had this like blackout experience where um it was this kind of a blackout experience where you have a sense of time so if anyone's ever if anyone's ever gone in for surgery and had anesthesia there's very quick change from oh i'm in the opera i'm in the anesthesia room mm -hmm. and then boom I'm, I'm there again yeah it happens instantly versus if you black out drinking alcohol you kind of have a sense of time passing mm. uh, in a, a weird way um and so th this experience is more of still had a sense of time passing um and then the next thing i was aware of was just kind of the visuals were extremely strong, like I was in space looking at stars, mm. and I had uh, no body. And it was kind of like the madness visions where it didn't, I wasn't aware of the, of myself in the room. I was just completely there. And there was no thought of like, oh, maybe I could open my eyes, or mm. maybe I could get up and walk. I was like, in space with no body um <laughs> like there was it was kind of like there was no me but i was just like perceiving things mm. and then had this um I, I guess the closest thing to call it is like kind of like a rebirth experience where i like slowly came back into my body mm -hmm. and then slowly became aware of i was in a room um had this experience of like the room kind of spinning around me because some of the things the shaman was doing was going in front of you making the music and then going behind you and in front of you and I kind of had this feeling of like oh I'm just like floating here like I can spin around to the back of the room and spin around to the hmm. front of the room he was physically moving I was like physically two. rolling yeah. over and rolling back um, <laughs> he was in a really weird position and was just like you know going because um yeah you could just get really flexible at the time a lot of the tension disappears out of your body anyways so going through this experience and then kind of like had this moment where come back into my body and it was really like everything didn't make sense to me anymore and what I mean by that is like I knew my name was Ryan but that felt weird yeah. I was like Ryan that's <laughs> very it's a weird sound that I attached to myself and I was like okay I'm in this room and I'm in Peru. I know these things, but it was just like, oh, that's weird. It's like weird that we call this thing Peru. Oh. And I'm here on like the other side of this like space ball. Uh, <laughs> so like, you know, just like reintegrating all of these like things that I would never have thought about before. I had this experience where I spilled some water on my leg and I was like, oh, that feels weird. 
Um, and then, you know, a second later, I went back and touched it again. I was like, oh, it's still wet. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't you like, why am I wearing clothes? Like, and I'm like, why am I wearing clothes? What are these things I'm wearing? These are so strange. It was just like every, all these yeah. like social conventions. Yeah, I was just yeah. like experiencing them as very strange. Mm. And then kind of just like slowly layered back in until the point where I was like, okay, I'm back in the room. I'm here. Uh, I'm Ryan. It's not weird. Yeah, anymore. I'm Ryan. It's not weird anymore. You, things, if you spill water, it stays wet. Um, my body is definitely, a, you know, I've got these leg things, these arm things, <laughs> everything's back. And then, so it was just a slow process of like starting out with just like, oh, purely just perceiving some sort of, um, visual data to like, oh, I can feel things. Oh, these feelings, they're correlated to this like physical thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then kind of incorporating some mental stuff like okay this is geographically where i am this is like who this is the sound i make to refer to the thing that i am Mm. wow so there's a there's a lot there um and for me this is interesting to hear from the outside because i've had lots of conversations with people about psychedelics and sometimes they say some very silly things but what you've just said makes me think that perhaps they are they, they don't, maybe they don't have philosophic training or they don't have the words to articulate exactly the experience and maybe they, they take the experience and take it in a really wild direction because people would say that you had the one with the universe experience, you know, you, you, the, the dissolution of the ego, you were everything. And then, I mean, I've heard this before, the visual from space, you get put into your body and then you relearn these things. It sounds like... <clears throat> From a philosophic perspective, what you've just said is something I would love to be able to articulate to people that are stuck in the mindset of thinking that the social conventions aren't weird. Because if you, you don't need the psychedelics to have some of those um, realizations, or it's like physical space and physical body and sensations, really it's a weird thing. Like if you just if you mm-hmm. think about what the mind is and what the body is, and then there's this correlation between the two. Social norms are this really weird thing. Clothes are this really weird thing. But we never think of those thoughts. And it's funny you say it's funny that you say those things because years ago, before I had any pot experiences, people would ask me all the time, Steve, are you high? When I would ask <laughs> questions like, why do we wear clothes? And what I used to think was like, Oh, because people who are high have all kinds of stupid, silly thoughts, and those be, that for these must they must think these are stupid, silly thoughts. But I thought this is a perfectly reasonable question. Why do we wear clothes? Now I realize after the experience that m- it seems like most people don't think about those things unless they take drugs. Just be- it's almost like a f- purely philosophic thing. Mm-hmm. They're not jostled enough out of their normal consciousness to realize like what is convention and arbitrary, and I would say mind constructed versus what is actual and out there. So it sounds like that was kind of a really extreme example where you're like, oh, I guess I have these limbs that I move and I guess my name is Ryan. Like, that's weird. (laughs) But it's true. That is weird if you think about it. That's goofy that that we call you, whatever that is, Ryan. Like, we say these words and that correlates to something. You know what that means and everybody knows it. That's a very weird thing, but you don't think of it as weird when you're stuck in it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Even if you look at yourself and you're like, wow, I've got... A lot of like limb space yeah. compared to most things. Yeah, and like if you think of the core of your body is quite small. I used to do this when I was a kid. I I remember having a conversation with my mother. There was a glass of water on our our kitchen uh, counter, and I was like, I am fascinated by this. Like, I know that 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 what's in that cup like makes life happen, and like there's stuff in that thing that we take and we put in our bodies, and it's like if we don't, we die. This is really weird. I remember talking to my mom. I was like, is it odd that I feel totally like occupied and I'm not bored at all just looking at a cup of water? <laughs> is that normal? And it's like, no, it's not really normal. But it's okay because it's true, you know. But, yeah, I mean, I feel like you can do that with anything. Like this hair on my arm. I think, oh, isn't it bizarre that we have this, like, clump of matter that just kind of slowly grows out of this other clump of matter and it's kind of yeah. fuzzy and sort of keeps me warm? I mean, it's just absurdity upon absurdity when you think about them. Yeah, yeah. and to... to to survive as a human, we kind of need to, to normalize those things. Yeah. And so it makes sense that we kind of just, you know, you can't, like a child, right? They, 
incapable of doing a lot of things and incapable of ensuring their own survival because they're like, wow, a plane, right. wow, a dog, wow, it's my best friend, oh, wow, it's my best friend again. Right. Uh, <laughs> and so to survive, we need to normalize those things. And humans are really good at adapting to the different situations. Um, and the way I think about the value of, um, I'll just use the value of drugs or mind-altering substances is that uh, as a human, you're kind of, you're, this perceiver, everything you interact with is coming at you. Um, It's kind of like this lane, and it becomes very normal very quickly. Depending on who you are, it becomes normal more quickly or less quickly. Mm. And drugs, especially psychedelic drugs, are this great way of pulling you out of that lane. So you're now perceiving all the same stuff, but in a completely different way. And so that's... a different conceptual framework. Yeah, and it's interesting in, in the new way it's coming at you, but I think a lot of the value comes from looking back and saying like oh hey i'm looking at this thing that now seems so weird to me that used to seem so normal Uh, and i think a big way this is helpful is looking back at your behavior you kind of switch up and you start thinking about okay i get really fired up about these things and they're completely ridiculous Mm. or uh, i don't know why i keep doing this like why do i keep drinking i don't like that i should just stop it Mm. you kind of have this like outside observer view of your behavior because your perception of things are different Um, and and so i think that's why um, drugs have a lot of value if you use them in an introspective way Mm -hmm. instead of almost all people or the most common way to use drugs now is in an escapist way we get drunk to dull the pain we you know people take mdma and go to a club uh, instead of you know closing the door in your room and turning the lights off and being going inside people try to run away from their experience and use drugs in that way and i think that's that's a lot of the reason why it has such a negative connotation because people don't actually get that much value from introspection Mm -hmm. now when you were talking there you said as a human these things make sense now is that one of those kind of weird conceptual categories that you're putting on your experience um and might that not be Correct. So I know I would do want to dive just a little bit into the metaphysics of those claims because when you're in that state when you're you're not the self, you're just kind of perceiving. I think that's the language that you use. Is there? Do you think that that is kind of truly the nature of your conscious mind? Is just the perception? It's not the conceptual categories of human in a body with a brain. It's you're the perceiver because. Of, a lot of Eastern philosophy and a lot of transcendental philosophy says what you really are fundamentally. It's not your physical body. It's not Ryan and all the associations with that. It's just that point of consciousness that happens to be stuck right now to your per- perception. What do you think about that? Do you feel like that really is like f- fundamental, that, that point of perception? Um. So I, I think that who I really am is pretty fuzzy and can't really be separated from um, my body or my identity in other ways and that consciousness mm-hmm. perceiving thing. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So you don't think it would be possible to just remain in the state of the selfless perceiver if you were to die, let's say, or your physical body, your brain would go away and all that, you couldn't stay from that universal perspective. And I ask this because this is the claim of Kind of like transcend your body. Exactly. This is what people say. This is essentially what happens when you die, is you go to that perspective. Like the idea of you have a soul that inhabits a physical body? Yeah, this would be more... And the soul usually implies that there's still some unique identity to you, that there's like Mm. a your soul... This would be the transcendental idea that says all of that is just kind of arbitrary conceptual things we're making up. Mm-hmm. What what you what the fundamental existent thing, your consciousness is just the one perspective, the one they say the God perspective. Yeah. That there we're all fundamentally, they claim, God. We've just forgotten about it. And then sometimes there are all of what we think of being as human beings are just little instantiations of that, that have forgotten that they are this, this one cosmic perspective. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting to think about because kind of a, a central idea that you can read a lot about with ayahuasca is this idea that we are 
all our own God. Mm. And I don't think I have that experience quite as deeply as Ryan did. Uh, I didn't have an experience when I, I left my body mm. and I, I didn't have the experience of returning to my body. But it seems quite common that people have that experience with ayahuasca and psychedelics in general, mm-hmm. where all of a sudden they realize like, okay, I kind of control my universe. Mm-hmm. I control my world. I control myself and everything that goes on around me and that nothing else does. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and then I guess to, to touch more on that is w- what I think is happening isn't that in the psychedelic experience, I, I think from brain scans on people who are using these drugs, it's like different areas of your brain shut down. Mm-hmm. So the experience of I'm floating through space isn't an experience of you have you know, correctly transcended an illusion, but it's your ability to perceive the physical things around you has shut down. Like your brain stopped working hmm. temporarily in that way. And therefore the, the conscious experience is illusory or, or essentially just a hallucination. Um, I think that's definitely one plausible interpretation. What's interesting is of the people that I've met with very like new age beliefs, this people claim this state of mind comes from psychedelics. It comes from meditation. It can come from like religious um, rituals that this is, this is the state of mind that a lot of people for thousands of years have been talking about and said there, the, the fundamental truth is there. It's not from our regular everyday perspective. It's from that. It's from that point of mind. This is why I think in, in my journeys, I'm, I find there's value in religion. I think there's truth to be found. I think that's mired in a bunch of nonsense. But this is such a consistent part of the human experience. That people say, oh yeah, I had this, and then I realized all the, uh, my self-perception was all wonky, and then like, it helped me be a better person. I realized love was really important, and it changed my life in these ways. It seems very, very silly to me that we would dismiss this just because the claim is, oh, well, you have these insights because you ingested a substance. I think that's a mistaken way to think about things. So mm-hmm. I do want to go back just to kind of in closing to some more about the contents of your experience while on the ayahuasca. So you, ha- you both had kind of negative and positive. Were there any other really powerful visuals or feelings or realizations that you had in that state of mind? Specifically, did you find there was any experience of what people call contradiction. So did you have the experience of something being and not being, or something being blue and not blue? Because I'll just say, in the conversations I've had with what I call irrationalists, lots of people also claim, oh, contradictions exist, and you can experience them in the state of mind once you've ingested psychedelics. Did either of you have that kind of feeling? Um. I, I really don't even know what it would mean to experience a contradiction. Yeah. Like, would it be, like with the example you gave, would it be that you know something's blue, but you see it differently than what you know to be true is blue? The way that it's reported to me is something like with the self. We'll say you are, but you really aren't. It's like you are and you aren't at the same time. Or like you have your self-perception and you don't have it at the same time would be one. And I would imagine other things like with colors, it's very hard to make sense of, but it'd be something like, oh, the thing was red and it wasn't red mm. at the same time. Now, I, I struggle with this. This is one of the reasons I'm scared of psychedelics is because people claim this, and I'm like, mm, that sounds crazy to me. Yeah. yeah. I don't think yeah. I had much of that. Um, my experience, so yeah, I, I can't conceptualize what it would even mean to like tr- truly experience a contradiction. Mm. Um, b- but the experience I had was just kind of like playing with these conventions. Um, mm. So experiencing myself and kind of having this like I can't remember what the context was but like oh wow I'm actually like quite small and then it kind of like like as a physically pers- physically like oh, I'm quite small <laughs> um, and like I'm you know I'm six foot tall um, at the time I was like 190 pounds or something and you know you kind of think oh I'm a big person um and then I'm like, oh, no, I'm actually quite tiny. And then I, something changed about the experience, and I was like, started thinking about it, and I'm like, oh, wow, I'm quite large. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, I'm small and large. Oh, yeah. um, and, and then also a similar thing happened to me about um, age. 
I, I can't remember exactly how it was happening, but just trying to like kind of quickly flip back and forth between this like feeling of experiencing being old mm. and being young. Mm. Um, like I think like obviously human life is kind of like average 80 years. So you kind of have this like strong sense of like, oh, if you're 60, 70, that means like you're really old and feeble. But that's not really um, like absolutely true. Mm -hmm. If we could extend life 300 years and that'd be like a quite young person. Mm. Um, So yeah, just playing with those things. But those aren't like, that's not a contradiction. It's just like changing you know, these words refer, like, what what does big mean? It's relevant to, like, what, the, mm. what you're comparing it to. Right. And so, like, in that experience could vary. They had this experience of kind of, I guess, learning that, like, a lot of these things are kind of mm-hmm. relative to other things. Mm-hmm. And so it was kind of this, like, oh, wow, I'm, like, also quite large and small. I'm quite, like, <laughs> old in some ways, but, like, also quite young in others. Exactly. Yeah, that's the key. Old in some ways not old in other ways. I think if, if I can see why people would take this and say, oh, look, take the psychedelic experience, you'll realize you're old and young, or like you're big and small, it's a contradiction, wow. And then they take that experience and they import it back into epistemology and they say, therefore logical contradictions exist and so on and things go off the, off the tracks really quickly. But when I've, I've had these conversations with people and when you really dive into it, it always sounds something like that, where it's an insight where, oh, in this way I had this property but from another perspective, I didn't have that property, you know, and then it's not a contradiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that contradiction is a word that I would use to describe any experience I had. I think it's just like looking at things from different perspectives. Mm-hmm. Like I think one of the great things mm-hmm. about ayahuasca is that it challenges you to look at your life from sort of like a different perspective. Like, Oh, I always do this. Like, Oh, but what if I did it differently? It's, it's not necessarily that it's contradicting it's just right. looking at it from a different different lens yes so ryan said his one of his peak experiences i think he said on the first time was this baby thing that you realized was part of yourself and then that was this powerful experience what was your peak experience was it was it the gypsy thing was that after you were after the earth hugged you was it just smooth sailing from there or did you have any other powerful experiences yeah so i think that my peak point of like sadness and pain was when I was lying on my side and I was just crying and crying and crying I think at that point Ryan was having I so I I (laughs) cried through uh, a happy song I just was like in so much anguish and pain at that point I just kept crying because he used my body as a bit of a drum which is (laughs) (laughs) against the uh, noble silence but it was kind of this like oh I'm here and I know you're sad but I'm having this really happy moment and I kind of want to share it with you Mm. which I felt like was kind of endearing and <laughs> he was just trying to do rhythm. He was like, I got this. I got this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe that. It felt like it was this, like, okay, I know that you're sad, but, like, you know, things will, things will come up from there. And then this rebirth from the earth, and then all of a sudden I was so free dancing in this field, and I feel like that was my low point followed by my high point. Mm. I definitely had moments after that. It just didn't go as low. Mm. Uh, like, my relationship with my brother has always been really rocky, and I was really not nice to him when I was younger and I I felt like I had this third party view of me being mean like I could see all these different points Mm, in my life like as if I was a ghost watching myself be mean to him and be like wow like you know I was the cause of so much of why we don't get along now Mm. like I was the older sibling and I was terrible as a child and I mean that spurred coming out of that that was like I need to reach out to him I want to apologize for these things I want to have a conversation around that um, so that was kind of like another, it was like a, a low where I felt sad, but it wasn't as low mm-hmm. as like me feeling like I was going to like die on the street. Now, when you say you were feeling sad and you had these, you both had this intense feeling of sadness. Is that coupled, is it sad because of X? Is it sad because you realize oh, I would have been a bad person or is it just literally the feeling of sadness, just like overwhelmed by the emotional feeling or is it tied to a, like a reason? I think that it depends on the situation. Like for me with my brother, it was feeling sad because I had been mean Mm -hmm. and it was, 
you know, these things that if I had reflected on my life, I would have clearly seen, mm. but I hadn't taken the time to reflect on them. Mm. I had just pushed them away and been like, we don't get along. We're different. Instead of being like, wow, I was really, really cruel when we were young. Mm. Like I was like hitting him and calling him names and shaming him and all these things that are really not nice. Mm. And being able to see that and feeling like this deep feeling of sadness that I had done that to this person that was my little brother mm. or that is my little brother and other instances where, you know, lying on my side and crying and being outside and it was raining and cold. I felt all these feelings, but they weren't as connected to something. Mm. Like I didn't really know I feel sad because of this. Mm-hmm. I just felt emotional feelings and pain. Mm. Yeah, and for me, I think it was kind of like this backlog of feelings. Um, Mm. My experience with emotions before that had been basically to completely reject the the reality of emotional experience. Mm -hmm. Um, It was, you know, anger that was acceptable, and that was like pretty much it. So Mm. I had no trust in my emotions. I didn't use them as like this kind of, pathfinder to say oh i'm feeling this way i should think about this i just completely Mm. rejected them and so in this experience was just like so much intense sadness and and, you know i probably hadn't cried before that for like i don't know maybe like once in the past 15 years Um, and so i just like cried and cried and cried and was like oh god there's just like so much and I, I feel like at the time it was connected. It wasn't like I was experiencing moments again, but I could just like see back to these points in my life when my experience of it was just numb. Like I turned off my ability to feel things and then looking back at it, especially after the experience, um, would just like look back and feel what I feel what I like well, my emotional experience was mm. at that time. At that time, I'd completely numbed myself to mm. it. Mm-hmm. Um, and look back at a lot of moments in my um, childhood, for example, where I was just numb and trying to escape through, like, video games. And But what I really felt was, like, this deep feeling of, you know, sadness and loneliness. Mm. And so it's like you, you, you had these emotions. They were bottled up but they really didn't go away. And so you got to you ex- actually experience the yeah, process. Yeah, because that, that's the thing that I kind of came away from it with this, um, this kind of, I, I call it a, a belief of mine that you can't hide from emotions. Like, they, they need to be experienced. Mm. Wow. And you yeah. can pause that, you can put that off, but, you know, the people who think that most of the people think they can just reject their emotional experience. Um, at least for me, my experience was that's not the case. What I did was completely shut this down and remove my ability to positively experience life. Mm. Um, so I went through this, you know, intense period of sadness and then had this experience of joy. And it was, um, it was this moment where I was like, Oh, this is what it feels like to feel like very happy like this is what joy feels like i've never felt this in my life before um and it's the connection i was making there is like if i try to turn off my emotions what i'm left with is just resentment and anger wow and if i open myself up to feeling sad a lot of the time not a lot of time but like experiencing sadness fully then that allows me the possibility of experiencing joy yeah Yeah, I definitely agree with that as well. And I'm a big believer in that our our bodies carry these things that we don't, that we don't experience. So I think that when people say like, oh, I'm over it or, oh, you know, I let it go. Like to me, those words, I'm like, I don't even understand what that means. How can you just let it go? It's not a piece of paper that you release into the wind and never see again. It's something that you need to feel. And I feel like if we don't actually feel the things that we need to feel, they just kind of fester in our bodies and I think that people experience that in all different ways from tension inflexibility um, obesity disease all these types of things and for me I I kind of felt like at one point it was like because I I had a lot of anger before 
that that I was already dealing with. And I felt like it was like the core of my being had been on fire and it was slowly extinguishing. Mm. That was kind of like the metaphor in my mind during Mm. that. And by the end, I was like, wow, like the fire's out. Like I feel this like sense of calm come over me. And just at the risk of rambling a a tiny bit, (laughs) because I think people would find it interesting. The experience I had was um, I had come out of um, a pretty serious back injury, um, had really no mobility in my back and had been the, the course of a year uh, and during the ayahuasca experience I had this kind of like involuntary clenching and releasing of most of the muscles in my body in this kind of progressive way like I started making these like painful fists hmm. um, that just like kind of crushing my hands and it was like I could fight it but it was like kind of in, involuntary in a lot of ways and through this process kind of come to this realization that all of this pain that I'm experiencing physically in my body on some level I'm choosing to do this to Mm. myself Mm. Um, and that sounds pretty pretty far out there but (laughs) I was just kind of realizing that oh I can just turn this off like my back is stiff right now um, but I can just like consciously release those muscles I'm in control of those Mm. and the connection was that this rejection of feeling in my body was me just like really clenching up everything. And that's kind of probably one of the more like woo woo things I've come (laughs) away from this experience with. But since then I've really noticed like when I go through a lot of the pain in my back and moments of tension are really related to um, stress. So if I, for example, have relationship things going on, my neck and upper back will kind of, flare up and become an area of hmm. of pain and obviously if i sit on my computer for a long time that does it as well mm-hmm. um, so when you said you f- you felt like you could choose to relax those muscles did you do it at the, could you literally do that yeah so it was this long process where it started with my hands um they were just like m- like cl- clenching the fists like you tell the point of pain um and then i could like shake it off like it was like cement and that, so it was this a very hmm. like elaborate like okay this really hurts and then I can like shake off the pain and so I'm just waving my hands around Um, and then it was kind of this like developing of nuance as I went through my body where I was like okay I can do this everywhere Hmm. it's like oh I can clench that in my back and then release it and it was kind of this involuntary like uh, as if my body like turned on this like program that was going to run like okay we're going to clench and release every single muscle in your body Hmm. and so I've always been very inflexible person like in high school when you do the fitness tests I can't even get to zero on the, <laughs> uh, on the hip flexibility thing where you try to touch your toes um, I'm stuck in the negatives and so after this process of probably just like moving around my body in all these weird ways uh, I was like oh, I feel like I could touch my toes right now and did this forward fold where I could actually bring my chest onto my legs like a complete full expression of a forward That's fold crazy. and I saw it this is the only other time we engaged during ayahuasca. He actually tapped me when I came back from the bathroom and was like, you got to see like, this. It's like, holy shit. Um, all crazy. of the tension I've in my body went away. I've never seen anything like it. And I just felt like a newborn baby physically. And so this... Wow. And then afterwards, that lasted for quite a while. But then the tension kind of slow Over the next couple of weeks, like, slowly creeped back onto my body, like, cement in a way. And it was never... It was um, basically for the next year I could just like easily touch my toes. Wow. So some interesting context to that too is we had had a bet the month before and Ryan's like, I'm going to touch my toes by the end of this month. We'd bet like something stupid, like chocolate or dinner or something like that. And he was stretching every day, working towards touching his toes. And at the end of the month, he was still like a couple inches from touching his toes. And then this ayahuasca ceremony happens. I mean, he's literally head down in his legs, like, comfortable like that and then after he's like look at it can touch my toes that's that like is so crazy it's amazing and it wasn't so it wasn't like this like switch that happened this was probably over the course of this was the second time we drank so we you know we'd been sitting there on the floor for like five hours and then i went through this kind of process that maybe took like 45 minutes of like slowly moving my body in ways to like, oh, I, I'm trying to move forward. Oh, that's tight. Maybe I could move over to the left and then come around. And I'm like, okay, now I'm closer. Um, so it was like, it, it was all 
you know, it was a few hours of like playing around physically mm. that happened. But yeah, it was that was one of the most like uh, I guess int- I don't know what word to use. Interesting experiences coming yeah. out of them. I was like this this thing has like real power to change. Um, you know the way I am. Did you feel like when you were doing that, you knew how to move to, to correct, or was it pure experimentation? Was it like, oh, maybe I could do this, and you just kind of worked and see what? Happened? Um, it, yeah, it was a lot of like kind of tuning in to that kind of instinctual like, uh, this way it feels good. And this is an experience I've had since then um, with edibles and with psilocybin. A lot of the first kind of psilocybin as well a couple times you've done I've just like stretched the entire time you're just like body just kind of starts to want to move mm, I like that idea and it's like mm, that's nice it's like you have to work to just sit there and your natural state is just to kind of keep moving around mm. and playing um, but yeah to answer your question it's kind of uh, you kind of like testing things out like oh let me try over here but not really consciously it's more like oh, I feel like this is the better way to do this. Mm. And so the the yoga realization that I kind of hinted at earlier was that I'd realized that when I was doing yoga, a lot of times I was, what what I was looking for for success in yoga was the feeling of tension in my body, which mm. is actually not what I should have been looking for. If I'm like, I reach a point where I'm like, oh, this feels tense. I shouldn't look to stretch my hamstrings by having this strong feeling of tension in my hamstrings. If my goal is mobility, I should try to move around that. Hmm. So this sounds like a very positive experience. It seems like you've learned psychologically. You can touch your toes. <laughs> um, how uh, this is, we're talking about a very taboo subject here, especially like in the States where I'm from, or like especially like growing up in a conservative Christian household, like super taboo. And yet what you've just described sounds nothing like anything that I've heard growing up about the horror stories of what happens, how you take a drug, you jump off a building and you're dead or you drill a hole in your head. Have you told a lot of people about the positive parts of this experience? Or if you tell people, how how have they reacted to that? Like, is, have people been open to, to you saying, oh yes, I learned quite a lot while taking drugs in Peru? Yeah, I mean, I think that everyone's a little bit different. I've had reactions of, oh, that sounds interesting, but why would you ever choose to puke? Mm. That's one that I've gotten a couple times mm. from people. I'm like, it's... <laughs> It's not like you're choosing to drink bad water that you know has poop in it that's going to make you (laughs) sick. It's not really the same thing. Uh, It's hard to explain that to somebody, though, to things like, wow, I've always been interested in that. Like, can you tell me more? Mm -hmm. I'm very open to that experience, to people being like, I've never heard of that, and I'm not really interested in talking about it anymore. Hmm. Yeah. Immediately afterwards, because this was like our first experience with anything, um, with any psychedelic drugs, I mean. Um, so it was just like this mind blowing experience. So mm. I think, I feel like we both had the urge to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Like, I've got to tell someone about this. This is crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, I got enlightened in the jungle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so it probably came up more, but yeah, it's still out there. So um, it's not like the first thing you tell people. And, and there's certain people, <laughs> there's certain people you meet and you're like, okay, this person gets it. Mm. Like you kind of get in that neighborhood and then you're like, okay, let's talk about this. Mm-hmm. Um, philosophically, I think that the way these things become untaboo is by kind of like coming out about them, talking about how, um, you know, a significant, one of the most significant experiences of my life was uh, an experience using a psychedelic drug. Um, and that it's something we should, you know, I think it's, I think it's not a crime to do this drug. I think it's a crime that people are prevented from having this tool Mm. that if you want to do this in the United States or Canada, you can get arrested. I think that's a crime. Mm. I don't think it's a crime to do the drug. Um, and so philosophically I've tried to like be as open more than I would normally and say like, oh, it's worth the risk for me. To face people who say, "Oh, I don't, I don't want to talk to Ryan because he's, you know, he does drugs, you know, very infrequently," mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's a good way to like filter people out. Anyways, I don't want to mm. really engage with those people. Yeah, um, I don't think there's been 
anybody who's been like, oh, you did ayahuasca, I'm never going to associate with you again. Though. Yeah, so, so to answer your question, we talk about it, you know, more after the fact, kind of talked about the subject with some of our closer friends, um, with people you meet who seem to have, you know, at least interests in that in that realm, but, you know, not... not and then less over time as well. So. Mm. Yeah, I find that my my rule of thumb is that I don't usually offer up the information unless there's a reason for it to come up. Mm. Because I still feel like my experience was a very personal thing and mm-hmm. I have no interest in somebody like shaming me for that choice. I don't want to engage with that. Mm-hmm. So if somebody wants to talk about it, I'm happy to talk about it, you know, just like we are now. And we've had tons of conversations about this mm-hmm. off the record as well off the record the right phrase for that (laughs) (laughs) off the microphone (laughs) now do you feel like you guys frequently think about your experience like when you go around in everyday life do the the insights that you've had like do they do they come up like or is this something that okay it was in the past i learned and now you're kind of occupied with other things sometimes i think that you know now that we've kind of talked about it and relived it i think it'll be like on my mind a little bit more Mm. noticing those things over the next couple days to a couple of weeks but it's been close to three years since that experience. And I feel like there's some things that have become ingrained that I learned from that experience Mm. that I took away from it or things that like fundamentally changed. Like it's like my mind opened up something that I'm not going to close again. And that just has become a part of my life. Like for example, like I kind of mentioned before that ayahuasca is really good at kind of opening up these parts of your your mind that have been closed off especially to things that you love doing there's been things like after ayahuasca I was like I've wanted to do yoga teacher training for ages I'm just I'm going to do it in the next year and I did do that and it's like I wasn't happy doing that job I've always felt like I wanted to do something different I'm going to pursue that and that hasn't shifted at all there's never been a doubt for me since that moment that I need to go back to the path that I was on before Mm. Um, other things though like specific specific things like I, I rarely think about the the fuzzy velvet fairy <laughs> she's, she's pretty pretty rare that it, she comes up for me <laughs> yeah I'd say it's the kind of like a slow process of thinking about it quite often and less and then less and then mm-hmm. less and we both kind of consciously integrated it uh, afterwards so we talked a lot about it we both journaled a lot about it did a lot of introspection mm-hmm. um, wrote notes and said these are the things this this is kind of like showing me a new path and this is how I'm going to walk down that path Mm -hmm. because I think it's possible, you know, go do an ayahuasca ceremony, fly back home, get in your same social circle, go back to your same job. Mm. Is anything going to change? Maybe a tiny bit, but probably not a lot. And for us, we had this kind of vision of a different future of a different way we could go. And so we said, um, we're not going to go back to the same city we used to live in. We're not going to, you know, it, it's kind of hard to say, but it's like a, a lot of the people in our life are going to change because these things all impact who we are. And if we want to be different people, mm. we've got to change these these things about ourselves. So it's not a thing that permanently changes who you are completely. I think it does in like small ways, but um, a lot of it was also just realizing that a lot of the change is going to be require effort and um, it's going to require you actually doing things mm-hmm. afterwards. And so mm-hmm. now a couple of years later, I think that a lot of those things that I thought about then and wanted to integrate have become fully integrated. I think that I've forgotten about some of those things, which is why I would like to go um, do this again at some point in the mm-hmm. future. Mm-hmm. That's what I was going to ask if you guys plan on, on having another experience, ayahuasca or other psychedelics to kind of explore this more. Yeah, um, I would I would really like to go back and do it in the the first time we went we just did two individual ceremonies which was really good and really valuable and we made quite a bit of effort to integrate it afterwards but I think going there and being focused and kind of doing something like a week where you're just you're either only like thinking journaling or doing this um, and having a deeper experience where you could really think through a lot of things would add a lot of value to it and mm-hmm. that's something i want to do in the future so you guys wouldn't be shy in saying that you think ayahuasca at least could be for the right in the right setting with the right person a kind of life changing in a positive direction medicine or technique or tool for personal growth 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think that it's really important to do it in the right setting. Like I would not recommend going out and making your own ayahuasca or right. finding ayahuasca off the street. <laughs> I think that the ceremony is part of what makes it really special mm. and part of what allows you to get really deep with it. Yeah, I think the context is huge. Mm. Like people, if you just ha- could buy it and, um, you know, do it on your couch with your friends and we watch Rick and Morty, you're probably not <laughs> going to get as much value out of it. Um, and so going there... Make, having someone who's an expert, having people that like make sure everything's going to go okay, doing it with a community of people who have traveled a distance because they're committed mm-hmm. to making positive changes, I think adds a lot of value to the experience. And if you were going to do it, I mean, just make sure you do a lot of research mm-hmm. because it can be, um, can find yourself in dangerous situations. So uh, f- find someone you know or like someone you second connection with who's done this, who knows a place where you can go. and. Mm. Um, have a safe experience yeah and then the last thing I would say about that is that we were both on a path of personal development at the point where we did it Um, we were both I mean Ryan was a little bit further down that path than I was but we were both journaling getting into meditation we were both doing introspection in our lives we were both working through um, the six pillars of self-esteem by Nathaniel Brandon which is probably the book that's changed my life the most and I feel like I think that ayahuasca can be beneficial at any point in your life, but I think that it was especially beneficial in a positive way for us because we were going down this path of self-development and we were both very open to, okay, you know, what else can we do? What else can change? What can we process? Yeah. It's not a magic pill. Right. It's not going to fix all your problems, Um, but it can give you some insight that will help you fix your problems, but you've still got to go out and do it. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect note to end on. Thanks, guys. This has been an awesome conversation. Thanks, Steve. All right, that was my conversation with the World Wanderers. I'm sure you guys enjoyed it. How could you not? As I said in the interview, you just can't dismiss these ideas. There is something here. There's some overlap in the area of psychedelics and religious experiences and human psychology and the philosophy of mind, all of these things are blending together, at least in the way that I'm thinking about this area. There's truth to be discovered. It's just covered and mired in large piles of bullshit. I think it's pretty obvious that Ryan and Amanda's experience found some of the nuggets of truth. There's obviously something worthwhile to be found if you can manage to avoid a bunch of religious dogmatism, and silly orthodoxies or really crummy or mystical interpretations of these type of experiences, I see no reason why we can't treat the psychedelic experience with a 100% rational analysis. So naturally I'm going to have more conversations with people about psychedelics, taking different psychedelics, the insights that they've had, and I'm going to try to get to the bottom of it. I'm sure many of my listeners have had psychedelic experiences, so if you're comfortable talking about them, start up a conversation on the YouTube channel. Let's find the fundamental principles that are lodged in the psychedelic experience, and we'll try to build a coherent and rational theory from there. So if you like this show, go to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson, and you can become a supporting member. There's currently over 85 other patrons of Patterson in Pursuit, And if you like Ryan and Amanda, you found them intriguing. They also have a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash theworldwanderers. All right, that is all for today. I'll talk to you guys next week.